Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest in the series of our inaugural professorial lectures. Um, this evening, we're here, as I'm sure you all realise, to witness the, uh, the lecture by William Kirk, our Professor of Applied Entomology. Um, I do say it every time, because I really mean it, that this lecture series is really important for the, the university in all sorts of different ways, but not least because we can show off the talents of our professoriate, whether they be internally promoted or externally appointed. And uh, at a time when many universities have given up on the idea of these, these lectures, I think for us it's important to, to provide this forum, which, which is quite a scary forum for the, um, for the lecturer, in fact, because inevitably those of us in the room will have different levels of background in the subject matter. Uh, and the challenge that we always give in the let letter that I was right to the uh, prospective lecturers is don't forget you've got a very varied audience um, and that it should be understandable to, to everyone. So that's, that's the challenge. Um, now William uh, graduated from Cambridge University in 1981 uh, and he did a, a BA in Natural Sciences. Then he did his PhD still at, at Cambridge on the ecology of thrips in flowers and he got that uh, within his three years. Uh, which was the way then, uh, in 1984. Um, we were literally running in parallel at that point, which is interesting. Um, he then got a Rothmans Fellowship, um, which took him for a postdoctoral uh, period, uh, still working on thrips, at the Waite Agricultural Research Institute at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. Um, and then he did further postdoctoral research funded by Emmanuel College in, in Cambridge. He then, in 1987, moved to Kiel as a, as a lecturer, and he has literally spent 38 years working on the biology of thrips, and in particular, how that might be um, used to manage thrips as a pest in, in crops. He discovered the first aggregation um, pheromone of thrips, which has led to the development of ther pheromone lures and traps which I'm sure he'll cover in his, in his talk. He has over 120 different publications uh, and has had in his career more than 60 different research grants. Um, William, though, actually spends time outside that core academic doing a lot of communication of science to the general public, which is absolutely critical. He does that through writing books such as Plants for Bees and editing a natural history book series. Um, he is best known, probably, it's probably fair to say, around Staffordshire, as the person who has trained many beekeepers in the county. Uh, and that's what he does on a, on a regular basis and continues to do. Um, he may, may touch on bees this evening, but uh, fundamentally, please join me in, in inviting William Kirk, our Professor of Applied Entomology, to give his inaugural lecture, The Secret Life of Thrips. Thank you. I should have said he's hurt his back, so he just looks a bit stiff. Hobbling a little bit, yes. Good evening, everyone. Um, before I tell you about the secret life of thrips, I thought I would diverge for just a little bit, if this works, yes, to tell you how do I end up, how did I end up as a professor of applied entomology? What was the, what was the career path, or what were the influences that uh, sent me in that direction? When I was a little boy, I suppose about seven or eight, in those days in the summer, on our Budlia in the garden, we nearly always had at least four species of butterfly. It shows you how butterflies declined uh, in, in over that time. But these four species, um, the peacock, small tortoise shell, painted lady, red admiral, nearly always on the Budlia. So in the middle of summer, you'd go out and you could see them on the Budlia, just feeding. Now, I couldn't help, and I don't think, I, I, maybe I um, misunderstand, but maybe I, I can't help thinking that most people, when looking at that, would be fascinated. Look at the beauty of those butterfly patterns, look at the symmetry, and then I would start thinking, why are they so different? These are four species of butterfly, all fairly common, all closely related in the same family of butterflies, 
They all feed as caterpillars on nettles, very similar, yet remarkably different patterns. Could it be, what, what could be the reason for those differences? And I think it, it points out that to ask and see interesting problems in biology, you don't have to go to the Amazon. Um, you can just see them in, in, a, in a garden. And that, I think, is probably what sparked my initial interest in insects, looking at these different butterflies, seeing the patterns, wondering what was going on. Are they signaling to each other? Is there any significance? Do those eye spots defend them, for example? If they do, why don't the others have eye spots? Why all these different colors, the blacks, the yellows, and the, the blues, and so on, all in there? Do they play a role, or are they just uh, irrelevant? So that sparked my interest. And when I was a little bit older, I bought from the local library, they were selling off uh, this book, The Organization of Entomology in Britain. And I have to say that since then, since it was published in all right, 1964, so I bought a little bit after that, um, a lot of that structure of entomology in Britain has gone, uh, not necessarily replaced with, with very much. But it did point out, it said, so this is advice in 1964, entomology at the universities was the, was the heading, and it said, entomology is studied at the following universities, Cambridge University, Imperial College London, and Oxford University. It didn't mention Keele University, perhaps it should have done, but um, Cambridge University stood out there, so I thought, that's probably a good place to go to study insects. But when I get, got a bit older, um, I wasn't quite so sure whether to study biology or to study maths. I knew I wanted to go to Cambridge, um, but I was told that if you want to study biology, you don't need to do A-level biology. So I didn't do A-level biology. I just did the maths, chemistry, and physics. Uh, but then when I got to Cambridge, so I went to Emmanuel College, um, a very beautiful college. You can see here's the, uh, the Logia, and the, this is the front of the Christopher Wren's design chapel for Emmanuel College. It's where Harvard was at university before he emigrated to the United States, and his legacy um, set up Harvard University. So it's a historic college uh, a fascinating place to study. So I had to decide whether I wanted to carry on doing maths or physics or chemistry or biology, uh, and I decided to go in the biology direction because I was still interested particularly in insects. So I think that early encounter with those butterflies set me on that path um, to, for, for my study subsequently. So I was at Emmanuel College. I did, as uh, the vice chancellor said, did my first degree, and then I wanted to do a PhD because I wanted to research insects. And I chose my supervisor first. It was Dr. Sally Corbett. And we discussed what subjects to do. And she said, well, why don't you study thrips? She said, thrips, the thing about thrips, whatever you study with thrips, it will be new. Um, because so little work has been done on them. And it's turned out to be correct. Just about everything I've looked at with thrips, it's new. Very few people really working on them, partly because it's so difficult to work on thrips. They are not the easiest insects. In fact, some people get put on the task of studying thrips. They move off quickly and study uh, a, a rather larger insect because thrips are very small and, and difficult. So I did my PhD at Cambridge, and then I did a postdoc at the Waite Agricultural Research Institute in Adelaide, part of the University of Adelaide. It's now uh, called the Waite Campus, but this had a, pride, a proud history of research on insects and particularly on thrips. In the 1950s, a major study of thrips population dynamics was carried out that is still in textbooks today. So this is a very interesting place to study thrips biology. And again, whatever I studied there, it turned out to be new, so it was a fascinating uh, study. And then in 1987, I came to Keele University. Uh, you notice the thing all these institutes have in common is blue skies, nicely mown lawns, um, <laughs> These, these are the, the, the best views, I have to say. But, uh, so I've been at Keele University ever since, and uh, all that time, my main research throughout that time has been on thrips. Okay, so that's how I've ended up as a professor of applied entomology. And I think by sticking at one particular subject, by looking at thrips over a long time, has allowed me to build up a sort of body of knowledge and expertise. I think a modern trend now is to follow the grant funding and switch between one insect and another and, and move around, and you don't really develop that insight into the subject that you do by sticking at one thing. I've been lucky I've been able to do that since 1981 when I started my PhD, all that time being studying mainly thrips. 
OK, so let's come back to the, the subject of a talk. Whoops. The Secret Life of Thrips. Um, and I'm going to explain, for those who are not familiar with Thrips, what are they? Um, why are they secret? Hence the, the subject of my talk, The Secret Life of Thrips. And then I'm going to introduce various aspects of their biology, various secret behaviours, feeding, fighting, mating, communicating. And lastly, one of the consequences that's very, been very important is how do you manage thrips when they are pests, using this knowledge of the biology. OK, so first, what are thrips? Um, that's a thrips. Um, they, are very, they don't look very small there, but they are typically about one or two millimetres long. As an adult, you can imagine the immature stages are even smaller. The eggs are about 300 micrometres long, so eggs are really very small. The adults are small too. And it's a curious uh, word, thrips, because it's both a singular and a plural. So I often get editors and people trying to correct me, but it's a thrips is the correct, um, correct word. Um, there's no such word as thrip, even though you see it written because people assume that it's, that's the singular. So uh, the, the interesting features, it's got very long strap-shaped wings with lots of uh, bristles coming off. Uh, these are wing fringes. And the name of the scientific order is Thysanoptera. Um, the Thysanoptera are the thrips. And Thysanoptera, from the Greek, means fringed wings. So they've got these fringed wings. This is an adult female. You see the head here with the compound eyes, the antennae, uh, three pairs of legs, one, two, three. Uh, and you can't see it, but behind there, there's a pair of hind wings. They've got two pairs of wings, three pairs of legs. Uh, so they're sort of typical insects, except that they are much, much smaller than most other insects. And I, the previous slide was an adult female. This is an adult male. Uh, the males are usually a little bit uh, not so numerous. Maybe 20% of adults in a population might be males. Uh, they are usually somewhat smaller. And you can see here as well the more parallel-sided abdomen. Uh, when you get your eye in, you can recognize the difference between males and the females. You may not have heard of thrips, but you might have heard of thunderbugs or thunderflies, particularly if you've spent any time in the east of England, because in East Anglia, vast numbers of thrips come out of cereals in July and August, and they fly in vast numbers out of cereals as they're drying to find somewhere to hibernate. And if you go into a church or a pub in East Anglia and look at one of these old framed pictures that's been on the wall for decades, so here's a picture um, picture frame, and you'll see all these little black specks that have got inside the picture frame. These are all thrips, and they're known locally as thunderbugs. Um, and they can land in large numbers when the weather changes, so you can be uh, walking along and suddenly find all these little black things over your arms in the middle of summer, um, because if the weather's changed, they all settle out of the air, so you can be, be covered in them. Or if you're cycling along in Cambridge, many people do, uh, the thing gets in your eye or gets in your nose, it's probably a thrips. So um, thunderbugs or thunderflies, they have a link with thunder um, even across much of Europe where the names in Dutch or French or German uh, often include the word thunder because of its association that when thunder occurs, large numbers of thrips tend to land. And uh, they move in such numbers, they often set off uh, smoke detectors so you end up evacuating hospitals because um, they get inside the smoke detectors. And so that can be quite dangerous. So thunderbugs or thunderflies, but that's just two or three of the species. There are actually about 6,000 species of thrips in the world. Uh, in Britain, getting on for um, 200 species. Uh, and of all those species, probably about 100 are pests. So a minority are pests, but they're very important pests. Um, they come in different types, different families. So you don't need to remember this, but... This one, Flea thripidae, is one family. It's distinctive because it's got a kind of tube on the end of the abdomen. This is a very common family of thrips. Most of the pests are in this family of thripidae. And then this one, which has patterned wings, is the Eolithripidae, and many of these are predatory. So we have thrips that feed on plants and do damage as to crops. We have some that are beneficial because they are predatory. Some can be pollinators. Uh, so we have a mix of them that can be damaging or, or beneficial. Some thrips look quite remarkable. Uh, so I've got a slide here, extreme thrips. 
So this is carcinothrips. All these are actually from Australia. We don't have any look quite as exotic as this from, from the UK. But this is one with enormous front legs. Uh, it appears that these legs are used because carcinothrips lives on acacia, and the leaves, which are known as phyllodes in acacia, get pulled together by these thrips. And we think it's using its front legs, very strong front legs, to pull these leaves together and then sort of hold them together with silk, and they form a kind of somewhere to live a kind of a, a structure within which they can uh, shelter. So that's carcinothrips with these enormous front legs. Then we've got lycanothrips. This is, um, doesn't pull the, gall, um, the uh, phyllodes together, but it forms a gall by feeding on the, um, the phyllodes, the leaves. It forms a kind of aberrant structure, and it can get inside. So it forms a gall as a shelter, but it's going to live in. Now, it has to do quite a bit of work for that. So... As you might imagine, as in many societies, there are some that are cheating, and other species, or other members of the same species, can try and steal that gall. So lycanothrips, this is an adult female. This one's an adult female too, because it forms the gall. This is an adult female. Notice these very strong front legs, with kind of daggers on the front. And it uses these to defend the gall against other females of the same species, or other thrips that are specialised in, in stealing the galls. And in fact, they come together with these dagger-like uh, front legs and they face up to each other and they try and stab the opposing thrips. And when they manage to stab it like that, the long front legs can raise the thrips up in the air and it's sort of skewered and unable to do anything. It's stuck there and they sort of repeatedly stab it until it gets a sort of mangled up uh, body. And uh, so these are quite aggressive, um, vicious. They're defending their gall uh, these adult females against others that are trying to steal it. And this species, uh, Zaniothrips, has these very strong, stout spines down the side of the abdomen. And this species specialises, it doesn't bother to make galls itself, it specialises in stealing the galls. It goes in and uses its abdomen to bash its way in and uh, defeat the occupants. So you can imagine it might be sort of like sort of gladiatorial combat, this one with the, with the daggers, this one with the spines on the abdomen. Uh, competing uh, to try and occupy a gall. Uh, these are all really in Australia. It's a fascinating biology, uh, but it's not easy to, we can't really study it here. So these are some of the extreme forms that I thought I'd show you. However, worldwide, they are very important crop pests. We all know about things like caterpillars eating crops or aphids or uh, the well known pests, but thrips are just sort of just off the list of the top few. Uh, they're still there, and in many cases, are very important pests. So by feeding, they can suck out pigment from petals. So when you have ornamental plants, uh, they get damaged in such a way that they're unsaleable because an ornamental plant has to look good. Uh, they produce little fecal droplets, these dark purpley spots there where the pigment is concentrated and get these little drops around the flower. So they sort of cause, make ornamental plants unsightly in glasshouses, they breed extremely fast. They're resistant to insecticides. They're very difficult to control. They are an enormous problem. And because they're very small, they're hidden away. So you often don't know that they've arrived in your crop. They're breeding up, and you don't really know until you start seeing the damage uh, that, that they're there. This is an example of damage they do to fruit and vegetables. So when the fruit is small, they feed on it, cause scarring. Uh, and as the fruit grows, this, in this case a sweet pepper, you can see the the scarring from feeding, but also stunts it, so it gets deformed. Of course, those, you know, you can't sell those in Sainsbury's or Tesco's because they don't look right. They probably taste just as good, but they probably have to go for some other purpose, being put into soups or something like that, rather than being sold as uh, at a high price uh, as, a, a, as a sort of attractive vegetable. So we've got damage to um, ornamentals, damage to fruit, damage to vegetables, all around the world, in temperate regions, tropical regions... Uh, there are pests everywhere. In this country, particularly in glass houses, uh, but also outdoors in, in other crops. Um, another way in which they do damage is that thrips um, transmit viruses called tospoviruses. So um, you can see on this table laid out by some growers in California, um, we've got a bit of a mix. These are ones that have been infected by tospovirus. The thrips have transmitted the virus, and the virus has multiplied within the growing uh, uh, peppers and chilies. So here you've got ones that have been damaged. There you've got the healthy ones that haven't. And then you've got some healthy chilies there. 
and then some sort of rather diseased ones have been affected, and then some sweet peppers that are healthy, and then some that have been um, damaged. So when they get this uh, virus, in this case something like tomato spotted wilt virus, um, the produce becomes unsaleable. And this is a very big problem. Not so much of a problem in Europe, but a big problem in the United States, a big problem in China, a big problem in Brazil. Uh, so transmission of Tosper viruses is, is a big issue. Okay, so I've introduced thrips. Uh, now, wh why are they secret? Why am I saying the secret life of thrips? Uh, I'm going to introduce a, a graph. It's the only graph I'm going to show you, and it's to try and make a, a point about what we think of as easy to observe from the human point of view. Um, so what, can we, what kind of behavior can we observe easily? Because what we can observe easily, we don't think of as secret, but if we can't see it, we can think of it as, as, as secret behavior. So on this graph, I've got the size of the thing we're observing. So we go from the very smallest here in micrometers, microscopic, millimeters, meters, simply enormous. I'm not sure anything's a kilometer large, but getting large. Um, and on this axis, I've got the speed at which the behavior happens. So we've got very fast behavior in the millisecond, too fast for us to see it, seconds, minutes, and hours. So this is really very slow. So we've got fast to slow, and here we've got small to large. Now, I put on there, it's a very rough idea, the box within which we can observe things easily, in which behavior is obvious to us. So... Um, I think the next slide. Okay, so this bit below here, this is things that happen very fast. So really rapid um, things um, are really something we can't observe below that dotted line there. And if it's really very slow up here, so for example, the growth of plants, plant leaves foraging for light or roots growing, it happens, but we don't observe it uh, unless we take some special measure. So if it's very fast, we could slow it down with film. Um, if it's very slow, we could speed it up with time lapse. But it's not things that we feel, feel familiar with from, from observing the behavior. So those things we, we can't observe easily. And then we've got the things that are too small, the microscopic things, the things below about a millimeter. So we've got a range of different areas where things are either too fast, too slow, or too small for us to be able to observe them easily. Now, when I ask students when they come up to Kiel what area of biology they're interested in, they often say humans, which obviously we can observe humans, but then they would probably, many of them will say animals. And if I say which animals, they might say sort of things like lions and tigers and monkeys and things that they can observe easily. And these are things that are sort of meter size, they're our kind of size, they do things on our kind of time scale. But there are many things that aren't on that kind of scale. So, Plants, for example. We can all see plants, but we don't see their behavior. We don't see how the leaves arrange themselves to catch the light and so on. So I'm talking about here, what behavior can we observe? So there's lots of plant behavior that we can't see. And so the title of my talk is sort of a bit of homage to Sir David Attenborough, The Secret Life of Plants. Why is it secret? Well, because we, can't, we can see the plants, but we can't really see what they're doing. We can't see their behaviors. Uh, so we've got plants there. Many insects in the right kind of range, bees, honeybees, bumblebees, we can just about see those. They're big enough, a centimetre or so. Um, they're in our sort of observable range. Whoops, wrong way. However, thrips, this is, you're probably wondering where thrips would come in here. Thrips, being about a millimetre long, are just sort of overlapping this end. We can just about see them. We could see them sort of bumping into each other, maybe in a flower, but the detail of what they're doing we can't easily see. And this is why I'm saying we've got a secret life of thrips, because they're in this range of um, small size that uh, we can't easily observe. We have to watch their behavior under microscopes. Now, that makes it a little more difficult, a bit more effort, but a point I want to make here is just because something is smaller than we are or bigger than we are doesn't make their behavior uh, and life any less interesting. So it's just as interesting. It's probably not, just not, not so easily accessible. So we call it the secret life of thrips. Um, okay, so what are some of these secret life things that they do? Um, feeding. Thrips feed, and they can feed, as you saw, on plant tissue. But when I started my PhD, someone said to me, thrips don't feed on pollen. 
because I was studying thrips in flowers. It seemed an obvious thing for them to feed on. Thrips can't feed on pollen. Uh, someone said it, said it would be like a snipe feeding on a golf ball. A rather um, colourful illusion here. But you see the problem. Very long, thin mouth parts. A golf ball would be rather too big. How on earth could a snipe feed on a golf ball? Obviously, it doesn't. But how could a thrips feed on a pollen grain? So that was one of my, the challenges I tackled as a PhD student, um, seeing thrips feeding on pollen grains. And sure enough, they do feed on pollen grains. And if I sort of orient you here, these are two different thrips. This is just a bit of the head. So that's the antennae, truncated. That's a compound eye. This is the front part of the body. This is where the front leg comes, and I've sort of cut it off, because otherwise the front leg would obscure this important part here. This is the mouth cone that comes down from the head. So the thrips is sideways on, with the mouth cone down. Uh, imagine the, sort of the, the substrate, the ground is long here. And that's the size of a pollen grain. So you can see how it's a bit like a, a golf ball to a, a snipe. How can these thrips feed on pollen grains? So this is a different type of species, a different family, again with its mouth cone up against the pollen grain. Well, pollen grains are a bit like a kind of rugby ball filled with a protein soup. So it's got a hard, very tough shell that the thrips would have to get through. But once it gets through, it can suck up very high value contents. So what the thrips do is they insert a mandible, they poke a hole, and then insert more mouth parts, and then they suck up the contents, and they leave behind an empty shell. So as you might think, looking back at this, you know, how is a golf ball going to get sucked up the snipe's beat there. Well, what's happening is it's not sucking up the pollen grain into the thrips, it's piercing and sucking out the contents. Because pollen grains aren't solid lumps, they're sort of um, containers full of liquid. But uh, it's very high in nitrogen, very um, high in protein for the thrips. So, this could be observed under the microscope, but I had to develop a technique to do it. And this technique was, because you can see this is the thrips upside down here, What's going on is right underneath the thrips. You can't see it from above. So I had to develop a technique where you look up at the thrips from below so they could either feed on a, some kind of cover slip and they're upside down or even using a gelatin capsule, the sort that's used for pills. Um, so the thrips is wandering around and you can rotate it and, and see up through, up through the front legs of the thrips. So here's the thrips. These are lots of little pollen grains, some stuck together. But here, I don't know whether you can see it very clearly, there are four pollen grains. It's one of the trouble with thrips. It's very small. Um, and the mouth parts, one of those, the top left of those four, looks a little bit darker. And that's because the mouth cone is applied to it and they're sucking out the contents. So this strips will move along, stopping at a pollen grain, sucking out the contents, leaving the shriveled sort of sack of the pollen grain behind and moving on. And so I found that they were doing it. But the next question was, how much pollen are they feeding on? Are they feeding on enough? Um, to make a difference? Would they reduce the amount that's available for pollination? So the next problem was, how do you count the number of pollen grains they're feeding on? It's no good following a thrips artificially and counting it because the behavior under observation with light on it and so on will change what it does. So I had a system where I set up, these are the pollen grains on a microscope slide, let the thrips go for 24 hours, and I had to devise a system to show up the empty pollen grains. So you see in this slide, these grains are not staining because the contents have been removed. So these are the empty grains that have been fed on. So these are after and these are before. So I could have the system set up and I could count the number of pollen grains. And of course, species with bigger pollen grains, they feed on fewer. Species with smaller pollen grains, they, they feed on more of them. But the thrips were eating, each thrips was eating several percent of the pollen in a flower every day. Now that might not sound very much, but sometimes you can have tens or hundreds of thrips in one flower. And so they could be eating a sizable proportion of the pollen that's available. So instead of thinking all those thrips in a flower not doing very much, they could be reducing uh, the amount of pollination. Okay, let's go on to fighting now. So I mentioned thrips that uh, defend their galls, the adult females. So this is a, a, a phyllode, which is a, the name for a leaf in acacia, in wattles. Uh, these are galls that have been deformed kind of growth, and the thrips can get inside. And here's one species, cladothrips, with these great like, dagger-like structures. And the other one, lycanothrips, again with these daggers. Uh, and I said that they fight each other in a quite spectacular and uh, quite brutal way, like gladiators, um, because it's life and death. You know, one's going to defeat the other, 
uh, and that will take over the gall, and the other will not probably have any offspring as a result. So we see aggression in thrips in these uh, acacia thrips uh, in Australia. Now, in the UK, we don't have such exotic-looking thrips, but we have thrips that we can easily see. If you look at uh, bindweed flowers, this is uh, scientific name is Calistegia, in hedgerows on a sunny day, you can see lots and lots of thrips. Uh, this is several species uh, running around, aggregating in the flowers. These ones, particular species, don't seem to fight, but some closely related ones do. Um, so I've been, I was studying these, uh, and you see here, uh, the pale ones are the males, uh, and every so often you can see a, a dark one, that's the female that's landed, and the females, in this mating aggregation, then mate with the females, and the female flies off. But before that, in some species, these males running around start fighting each other. The problem is we still don't know why they're fighting, because they don't seem to gain any great advantage, because the females seem to mate with the first male they encounter. So what's the point of these two males spending time fighting? Um, here's, here's another example. This is in uh, a species called Franklinella boinquen on a, a Tithonia flower in Kenya. And you'll see these yellow flowers, all these little yellow thrips, very pale, not very obvious, but there are lots of them uh, moving around, the males, again, and occasionally wagging their abdomens at each other and fighting. So I'm now going to show you a video, which is taken by Leki Akumbe, who's here somewhere, uh, doing his PhD. Um, in this, what on earth is that? Well, what we're doing is looking down a microscope at a little arena, that's an artificial arena that's been made. So this is pink wax, dental wax, because it comes in nice sheets, and you can cut out a little area and put your thrips inside to observe them nicely. And on top, we've got a cover slip to keep the thrips in. And you can see we've got two male thrips here that have been put in together. Now, usually when the male thrips are in, sometimes they bump into each other. Sometimes they do a little bit of wagging and fighting. But in this particular case, if I start it off, um, you'll see they find each other and then start fighting. These thrips really don't like each other very much. Uh, many of them would just part and go away. But they can keep this up for quite a long time. This is what's called an escalated bout of fighting. And um, we suspect that what's happening is that when the thrips males are evenly matched, they carry on fighting. If one's obviously bigger or stronger than the others, they do a few quick wags and one realizes it's going to win, one realizes it's going to lose, and, and they part. But these ones uh, keep going. This doesn't happen very often, but it's been observed by others. Escalated bouts of fighting. We'd really like to know what's the point. Why are they doing this? You know, looking down, these things are only one millimeter long, and yet quite vicious fighting. And this is quite dangerous because sometimes when they wag at another thrips, they can actually throw it across the arena. Uh, you can imagine that quite be quite injurious, potentially. So these, these could easily wander apart, uh, but they're choosing to stay and fight. There's obviously some, some advantage to be gained. Sometimes they wander on, wander away, and then come back again and attack each other. OK, so you've seen this rather rare thing of an escalated bout of the, of the males fighting, which is part of what goes on in the aggregation behavior as part of mating behavior. OK, so let's come on to mating now. Um, you've seen the aggregation, but what happens when the female lands in the aggregation and, and a male approaches? Um, I'll take you through the series of stages. Uh, the first stage is, as you've just seen, males aggregating. So it's my little diagrammatic thing here. I've got a few males. There's a couple of males fighting. And they produce, the males produce, an aggregation pheromone. And we discovered the first one here at Kiel in about 2001, the first one in any thrips, and it was in a species called the Western flower thrips. Uh, and this aggregation pheromone is produced by the males and attracts both males and females. So you can see how males come to the aggregation and females come to the aggregation as well. Uh, and then mate, and then fly away. The males stay, so mainly what you see in aggregation is just males with brief visits from females. So we've got a role here in brackets. I'm putting the, the pheromones, the chemistry involved in this behavior. So males aggregate, then the females approach and land. Again, they're responding to the aggregation pheromone. Male and female make contact. Often it's the male walking up to the female. So we've got the making contact here. 
And when they meet, they uh, antenate, they wag their antennae at each other, and they can use that to sort of taste, if you like, the, what, uh, what the other thrips is for recognition. And so they use substances called cuticular hydrocarbons. These are coating the surface, the cuticle, uh, and they can very quickly recognise things like what species, whether it's male and female, all sorts of information from that very quick contact. Then if the right signals are received here, the male will then mounts the female. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, and sometimes uh, the female has got on it an anti-aphrodisiac pheromone. Now, an anti-aphrodisiac pheromone is a substance that's applied by a mating male to a female that marks it. And then it tells other males and it, if it comes back, that that female has already mated. So they might avoid mating with females that already mated because they probably won't, aren't going to have any offspring as a result if another male has got there first. So the male will detect whether there's an anti-aphrodisiac pheromone present. And if there isn't, it'll mount the female. If there is, it may just walk away very quickly. Within, within a second or two, it, it can detect that. Uh, and then copulation can take place. So is the smaller male on top of the slightly larger female. The abdomen's making contact at the tip there. And the male if this is mating for the first time with this female, will apply an anti-aphrodisiac pheromone. So it's putting it onto the surface of the female. We're not entirely sure how, but I'll suggest how they might be doing it in a moment. And then after mating, it might take three minutes in some species and other species as long as six minutes. Um, they will separate. So that's the kind of process. So let me just show you some pictures here. So this is the antennal contact process. This is... Um, We've got the male coming up with its antennae here to the female. It just wags them, sort of little flicker of the antennae, touches with the tips of its antennae, touches the female here, and can very quickly, in a matter of seconds, detect information, like, is it the right species? Is it a male or a female? If it's a male, it probably ought to be fighting it. If it's a female, then it's going to climb on top and start mating. So it obviously has got to make the right decision quite quickly. So that's the antennal contact. Now, when the female uh, and male start copulating, here's, here's the male on top, abdomen's joined there. There's the antennae. Often the antennae are in contact with each other. They antenate each other, passing on signals, sort of maybe for recognition, confirming recognition. This is the front leg, and these, this is the mid leg. And the mid legs of the male move quite quickly, and they stroke the female the female sort of uh, thorax and abdomen here. And we suspect that this movement of these legs, we don't think this is some kind of tender motion of stroking by the male, we suspect it's applying the anti-aphrodisiac pheromone. It's marking the female to say, I've mated with this female, and tell other males not to mate. And often towards the end of mating, they may form this kind of V position, um, and there's a calm period, a period when they both stay very still. We suspect that's a stage maybe when sperm is being transferred from the male to the female. Initially, there can be quite a bit of activity, and then they sort of stay still. In fact, when you see this in a moment, you'll think that maybe the, maybe the video's broken or the computer's frozen or something. Um, it worries me when I see it, because that's what I think. Okay, so that's the V-shaped position towards the end, and the male then walks away the female stays still, but its abdomen gets pulled, so there's obviously quite a connection there that has to be kind of pulled apart as they separate at the end. Okay. So, now, if this works, I've got some video of a male mating with a female. I have to orient you a little bit. Um, so, um, here we've got the female. Okay. And ignore that. That's the, that's the shadow of the female. Um, and let's just set the video going. So the male emerged from over there. It antenated quickly. It detected the female. It's turned itself around. It's mounted. It's put its abdomen behind the female abdomen there. And you can see these mid legs here stroking. Uh, you can see them moving. You can see the antennae antenating, moving, sort of flickering, uh, detecting uh, the female. But again, this stroking behavior goes on. Uh, and then at some stage, it will sort of it does stroking for most of the time. The female stays pretty still for most of the time as well. And there's a calm period. So 
So the antennae is still going, so the computer hasn't frozen. Again, you can see this movement of the legs here, um, which we think must be, a, we can't think of anything else, much else that it can be apart from applying anti-aphrodisiac pheromone. So this, this species is the Western flower thrips. This is a major pest that's spread around the world. We have a culture of it here at Kiel. We've done a lot of research on this, studying the pheromones and studying the behavior over, over many years. Um, but not all thrips behave quite like this. Um, in this one, um, a virgin male encountering, uh, sorry, uh, and it, well, in this case, it's what we call an experienced male. This is a male that's older and has mated sometimes before, um, will then encounter a virgin female and then will mate. I think, I think probably we should just skip, not wait to the full end of this. It's only about three minutes, but uh, obviously see much the same. Let's contrast this with another species. Um, the bean flower thrips is called Megalurothrips shostati, and we've got a project on this in, uh, in Kenya. And when this one mates, it's a rather different story. So again, um, we've got the, the wax arena here. You can see the circular arena. You can see the female here, and you can see the male. The male is smaller, sort of very long, parallel-sided. Now, when these two come together, it's more like an all-in wrestling match. The male will sort of... The ball of action between a male and female, and then they'll part, perhaps, because it, it hasn't worked. They'll come back together again, and then suddenly they'll be still, and you suddenly find the male's actually managed to start copulating with the female. Uh, we're working on this. We don't fully understand quite what's happening. Um, let me just show you the video. You'll be amazed at the contrast with the Western flower thrips. It all happens very fast. Ball of activity. Back together again. And then suddenly, look, the male and female have started copulating. They've joined together at the ends of the tips of the abdomen. But in this case, the male is kind of dragged behind the female. Um, and it carries on like this. So, again, you've got a kind of calm period. Occasionally, the male seems to move its mid legs as if it's trying to apply an anti-aphrodisiac pheromone, but it's not getting much chance. So, again, you've got a calm period where it'll stay still for some time, but completely different behavior and different sort of interactions that we're studying, trying to contrast between these two different species. Now, you might say, this is all very well. Um, why is um, mating behavior of thrips of interest? Well, one reason it's of interest is that we identified the aggregation pheromone, one of the first things we did when studying this, and the aggregation pheromone can be used. So I'm going to come on next to communicating, um, which will include mentioning various different, some different pheromones. So this was an early example of evidence that there are pheromones in thrips. Uh, when I started my PhD, someone said to me, thrips don't have pheromones, uh, they can't because they're too small. Um, so I, perhaps I've uh, set out to prove that person wrong. Um, here, this is an example um, from studied by someone called Ross Keister in, in uh, Panama. And these are smooth bark trees in Panama. And you can see a load of adult thrips here together. And then a group of larval thrips. They have cooperative brood care. So on these tree trunks... The larvae are kept together, like a kind of kindergarten, and the adults cooperate in looking after them, and they have a kind of bivouac. So overnight, they all stick together in a group, and then by day, they all wander around the tree trunk in little groups, um, foraging, feeding on fungal spores, and then at night, they come back along these trails uh, back to their bivouac uh, and, and stay there. So strong evidence, really, that there's some kind of uh, trail pheromone being laid that they're following, uh, and evidence of social care as well in, in these thrips. So early evidence of communication. Um, we then uh, wanted to study this aggregation. We thought there would be an aggregation pheromone in thrips, partly because they have, males have glands uh, down the abdomen, which we thought would be producing, must be producing something, which we thought likely to be an aggregation pheromone. So back in, uh, in fact, we identified in about 2001, um, the male produced aggregation pheromone. We found two components. So for the chemists, one was nerile S2-methyl which is this structure, 
and the other one was arl of angelyl acetate, which is that structure. And what this graph shows is the trace of a gas chromatograph. So over time, it separates out all the volatiles that are produced by the thrips, and each compound comes out as a little peak. So you can see we get a big peak here, which is one of the compounds, and a big peak here, which is the other compound. So that's for the males. And reflected below, for contrast, is the same trace for the females. And you'll see that that is present in the males, not present in the females. And that one is present in the males and not in the females. That peak is present in both, so we're not so interested in that. We were looking for something that the males produce um, that's going to be used for these aggregations. So those two compounds we discovered a long time ago. Um, so you go very quickly from pure biology to applied biology, because if you've found something that can attract thrips, uh, you can enhance trap catch. You can help a grower um, remove the thrips from the crop. You can perhaps uh, help in quarantine, identifying um, a species that's coming into a country and help specifically trap a particular species um, to remove it. Okay, so that's a, just a very brief mention of some communication in thrips. There are many different pheromones that are used, um, uh, dozens and dozens of them. Okay, um, so uh, lastly, managing thrips pests. How can you use those pheromones um, uh, for uh, thrips pest management? Well, the pheromones that we discovered have been turned into products, which is a very satisfying end for research. It gives a strong research impact. So, for example, uh, the company then, it was Syngenta Bioline, but now it's called Agriline, uh, Bioline Agrosciences, uh, produced this sachet with lots of little rubber scepter with the pheromone on it, and growers can buy these and stick them on traps to increase their trap catch. Or they can also use it because it can activate the thrips and enhances other control measures, so it has other properties. So these are a scepter in a, uh, these little lures like this uh, in, in a sachet. Another company, Russell IPM, has produced them as little plastic rings like this, which have get a, a better controlled release, so they can last several weeks in the field, releasing an increasing trap catch. Um, uh, so there's one in action. And I visited a, a, a grower in Kenya who is using these uh, traps um, in herbs, herb production, and he said that by using these uh, lures, they had reduced their pesticide use by 40%. So you can reduce pesticides by using these more environmentally friendly lures for um, trapping your thrips. And this is a more recent development by a company called Russell IPM. They've taken the pheromone, microencapsulated it, and coated it on the glue of these roller traps. Now these roller traps, these are about 30 centimetres tall, and you roll it out, and they're about 100 metres long. So this is actually quite a hefty thing to carry, but you can roll it out in a crop like this, um, and blue is a colour that particularly incre uh, traps western flower thrips, and it's coated, uh, this is Optirol Super Plus, and the plus signifies it's got the pheromone added. So it enhances the trap catch uh, for, these, uh, for these traps. So in high-value crops like strawberries in the UK, you can roll out these traps with a pheromone, you can trap a lot of thrips, and you can reduce the thrips numbers in your crop and at the same time, you can reduce the amount of damage done to the strawberries. And by reducing the damage, once the strawberries are damaged, you sort of more or less throw them away. But because it's high value, a small loss of strawberries is quite a lot of money for the grower. So they can afford um, quite expensive treatments uh, to re reduce their damage. Okay, so I think I've explained the secret life of thrips, uh, various aspects of their biology, and how understanding that biology can be turned into... Uh, useful products that help growers uh, and, and have impact. So I just want to finish by acknowledging various people, uh, my wife, Maria, um, for support with my research over many years, um, Dr. Sally Corbett, who was my PhD supervisor and set me on the path of studying thrips, uh, which was um, a very good decision. Uh, and then I only mentioned a few of the people in my group, um, the ones that have been involved in some of the pictures I've shown, uh, uh, Adeyemi Akinyemi, who was my PhD student, is currently my postdoc in, in uh, Nairobi, uh, who did some of the videos of, of, of thrips. Ian Dublon, who was a PhD student and took some of the photos you've seen, some of the nice photos. Uh, Gordon Hamilton, who worked with me on identifying uh, some of the thrips pheromones. 
Claire Sampson, who worked on the mass trapping um, with those big blue traps uh, and now works at Russell IPM. Uh, Lekia Kumbe, who is here somewhere and produced the th video of the, of the thrips fighting and is working on uh, male uh, interactions. And some of the funding at the moment that I'm working with, this is a project we have in Africa, in Nairobi, working on beanflower thrips, funded by the BBSRC and linked with ISIPE, um, the International Centre of Insect Physiology and Ecology. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you.